Um, Dr. Hyla Cass, uh, most of you probably Googled her or read the profile online. She's uh, one of the longest running uh, medical doctors in the world of functional medicine. She's been in functional medicine so long that when she started they thought she was a heretic and, uh, and literally doctors would, would, would hunt people like her down and, and shame them publicly. And now functional medicine's coming to the, uh, to the top. We're going to talk a lot about that. And, uh, we have uh, just a wonderful opportunity. Uh, Dr. Cass came to us um, about a month, a month and a half ago, maybe two months ago, for her first treatment. And like a lot of other people, weren't re wasn't really sure what she was going to expect. Um, after the first treatment, uh, she realized that there was a little bit of pain involved, but uh, she handled it like a champion. And uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, literally, the world's leading expert on functional medicine, Dr. Hyla Cass. Thank you. So I've been doing this for over 25 years. Uh, I was kind of an early adopter, but that's just because I think outside the box. It wasn't being like rebellious or, you know, I'm going to be outside the system. It wasn't anything like that. It was just like us following my own truth, and that's what I do. And, and many, of, many of you here do as well because you're here. You know, you're here because you do something differently, okay? So... Uh, we're all in this together, honey. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm going to talk about how my approach to the brain is different. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm board certified. Uh, by the way, I've written a bunch of books, uh, Eight Weeks to Vibrant Health, Natural Highs, which is not about pot. Natural <laughs> Highs is about how you can make your brain do what it's supposed to do naturally with diet, nutrition, exercise, music, movement, all kinds of things. So that was Natural Highs. Eight Weeks to Vibrant Health is more about your whole, your whole body, your whole system, hormones, digestion, the heart, all of that. And then the addicted brain and how to break free, I wrote because we have, in case you didn't notice, an epidemic of addiction. And a pretty addictive society, right? And if it's not to cocaine, it could be like to meth or heroin, or gambling, or iPhones, or Facebook to say that, guys, because, you know, we, we all like it. But we get our dopamine hits in different ways. So I'm going to explain how that works, what the mechanics are, what the mechanism is, and then how you can trigger it in your own brain so that you're less dependent on the outside stuff. It really is very empowering. And that's really what I want to do is empower you. Now, as a psychiatrist, you know, mostly you go to a psychiatrist, and what do they do? They write a prescription, right? And I'm not one of those. Because um, very early on, in fact, during my training, I trained at uh, Cedar sinai UCLA Medical Center. And it was very psychodynamic. So I learned how to do psychotherapy, which a lot of psychiatrists hardly even learn anymore. They're just writing prescriptions for meds. Now, meds are sometimes useful, so I'm not going to knock them. but so often they're not useful and have great huge side effects and what the research shows which is really kind of crazy because these are the almost the best-selling pharmaceuticals it shows that it's largely placebo effect when you're on an antidepressant and people are going to argue about it and say oh no no but it really helped me well if it helped you fine great um, but Many, many studies have shown that when people really believe that they're on one, even when they're not, they get better. And people that are on them sometimes don't get better because they think they were given the placebo. But they usually don't. By the way, it's hard to think you're given a placebo because you have the side effects, right? So you have to have a placebo with side effects. Anyway, so rather than writing prescriptions for medication like that, I actually evaluate the person, see what's going on in their whole system. Is it their hormones that are out of whack? Is it thyroid? Is it that they're not digesting properly? And if you're not digesting, you don't have nutrients. If you don't have nutrients, you can't make your brain chemicals. If you can't make your brain chemicals, you're going to be anxious, depressed, spacey, not thinking straight. 
Can anyone identify with that? You know, when you're eating right, your brain works. When you're not eating right, what happens? Foggy. It goes south. Yeah, your foggy brain. And I noticed that really early, really early in my, um, just sort of toward the end of the residency, that when people's blood sugar was low, they'd be kind of spacey and not functioning. And I, I began to look at diet and coach people on their diet and see wonderful, wonderful results. And even to this day, I get people that have been diagnosed as bipolar. OK, that's serious. Diagnosis bipolar, you know why it's serious? It's serious because you get put on a bunch of meds. You don't get put on one med. You get put on an antidepressant, an antipsychotic, a mood stabilizer. Uh, you may be put on a stimulant as well to counter the downer. You've got to have an upper to counter the downer. And these poor people, I mean, they are really in a fog. So what I, and many of them really just have blood sugar problems and B vitamin issues and essential fatty acid problems. And like, what if some people have issues with vitamin B and essential fatty acids and others don't? Well, it can be stress, lifestyle, or even genetic. So when I'm looking at somebody, when I'm evaluating them, I also look at their genetics. Because if you have a tendency to have a methylation defect, you don't methylate well, you're not going to be able to make neurotransmitters. So that doesn't mean you're doomed. It only means that we have to give you things that help to methylate, like methyl B, methylfolate, methyl B12. So we just, we know what to, how to compensate. Um, we know, for example, that when people are prone to have cancer, genetically, they could have cancer. But if they eat lots, of, even the Cancer Society says if they eat lots of fruits and veggies, right, it's going to really lower their chances of getting cancer. They have the same genes, but the epigenetics are different. So it's the same thing with bipolar illness, with depression, with addiction. You have the bad genes. Yeah, you can have bad genes. Your whole family, they're all addicts. They're all alcoholics. They're all ADD and thieves and gamblers because they have what's called, <laughs> really? <laughs> hey, I, do, I don't listen. I have not done any background checks here. <laughs> But this is reward deficiency syndrome. See, it's all related. Reward deficiency syndrome means that genetically, you're predisposed, not you, but one is predisposed to having a lack of dopamine. Dopamine is what makes you feel, yes, good, right. That's how you feel when you get, ping, you got an email. Ping, you got a, you got a Facebook thing. And ping, um, or a gambler, when, he, when they hit the jackpot. Hey, you know, it's that ping. Or a, a, a sex addict, when they score. <laughs> or, really, dopamine, it's just this stupid dopamine. It's the stuff we make in our own brain. So if you can make your own dopamine, you're not going to be dependent on these outside sources, which doesn't mean you don't have to enjoy all those other things. I mean, it's fine. You can enjoy whatever you want, but you, you will no longer be a slave to all that. That's the point. So really what I want to do, as I said, is empower you to know what to do, how to do it. And I'm, I don't want to do a whole big long lecture because it's, it's evening and, I mean, it's also like being in school. Like, we don't really want to be in school. But I have to give you a few little basics. So just really quickly, we need to eat fats, carbs, and protein, right? So what are examples of good protein? Fish. Fish, fish yep. Fish. Any particular kind of fish? Deep water fish. Fatty fish. Deep water fish, yeah, fatty fish. Chickpeas. Quinoa. Quinoa, and also about fish, no, low mercury. You don't want a lot of mercury, so you don't want the really big, big fish like tuna. Do you know that tunas are not little things that fit in a can? Tunas are very, very big fish <laughs> that accumulate a lot of mercury. Don't eat tuna fish. I'm really sore. You can. Okay. Chickpeas and quinoa have protein, yeah, especially if you're a vegetarian. Almonds. Almonds have some protein. A lot of veggies do have protein in them. Chicken, turkey, again, eat organic that hasn't been fed antibiotics and <coughs> hormones. I'm sorry, what was the? Grass-fed. Grass-fed. Please grass-fed because why, why grass-fed? Can somebody mm -hmm. answer that one? Because the, when they're fed the processed grains, what happens? They, get, they have the wrong kinds of, of essential fatty acids. They don't have the omega-3s that we need. So, and they also have antibiotics and hormones we don't want. So, yeah, so we need good fats. So we cover that, avocados and other good fat, flax, fatty fish, 
we need um, a little bit of carb. Carb we can get from veggies, not, not from bread. Bread's not a good idea. A lot of people are gluten sensitive. OK, so these are all the things I look at. Because gluten sensitivity can give you inflammation in your gut, which can give you inflammation in your brain. It's not the topic tonight. I'm just throwing that out because it's an issue. So that's, um, you know, for psychiatrists, I'm doing a lot of medicine. Can you see? It's, because it's all, it's all related. So in order to make your brain chemicals, you need to have um, the brain chemicals are basically neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin. I told you about the dopamine. If you don't have enough, you have reward deficiency syndrome. Acetylcholine which is for memory. Serotonin. What does serotonin do? Feels good happy. Feels good. Yeah, and we know about them from the SSI. What was that? Something. OK. So we, serotonin we know about from the SSRIs, like the Prozac, Zoloft, Selexa, right? So the, uh, when you're low in serotonin, you're irritable. Um, you can even be violent. They found that really violent criminals had very low levels of serotonin. OK, but they didn't have a Prozac deficiency. I mean, that's what people think, Prozac deficiency. They need some Prozac. <laughs> no, it's a serotonin deficiency that can be repleted with 5-hydroxy tryptophan or tryptophan. So OK, so serotonin and then GABA. GABA is the, the chill, the calming neurotransmitter. I actually cover these on my website. So if you want more details, you can always look at my website. Oh, in fact, I have a little ebook in case I forget, because sometimes I forget to tell people this. I have a little ebook called Reclaim Your Brain. It's free on my website. If you go to my website, casmd.com, and you sign in, you put in your email and your first name, you will get a free copy of Reclaim Your Brain, which really explains all the stuff I'm trying to talk about now and how to make neurotransmitters. So you can make acetylcholine. You can make dopamine, serotonin, GABA. You can make it by taking certain amino acids together with certain vitamins. So like, like baking a cake. <laughs> You, you got the, I'll give you the recipe. In fact, I have formulas that I've put together that have the ingredients. So when you take them, you can activate your own GABA, serotonin, acetylcholine, dopamine. So isn't that cool? That, that, so that's, that's what I mean about being empowered. So yeah, in a, in, a, in a way, you're kind of dependent. People are dependent on me to give them the answers. But it's an education. I'm not sitting there with a prescription pad saying, well, oh, you have to come back every month, and I will dole out the you know, my, my supplements, you know. You can go to a health food store. You can order things online. You can get them from me. Uh, I always prefer people get them from me because I know what, then I know what they're getting. You know, I know it's like really, or get them here because they're, they're things that I know, there's quality control there. Sometimes you don't know what you're getting with supplements on the outside. Uh, but there is, there is generally quality control among the good companies. So, um, I think you probably have some questions at this point. Well, why don't we, so, uh, why don't we if you mind, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask you, and yeah. maybe we can stimulate that off. OK. OK? Sure. Fantastic. So do um, you prefer standing, sitting? How do you want to do it? Three, two, two, two. I'm going to stand. You stand? OK, I'll stand. how about I stand with you? OK, let's stand. <laughs> OK. So uh, why don't you tell us, first of all, what, ex what inspired you to be a doctor? What inspired me? My daddy was a doctor. Is this anybody here a, a doctor's kid? OK, so when you're a doctor's kid, OK? There's something different about doctor's kids. We kind of grow up with it. I mean, he had patients calling him all the time. He had his office in the house. So it was like I was, we were all, there were four of us. We were part of his practice. I'd go, I'd answer the door. I would talk to his patients. I was just this little kid. And uh, to me, it was like interesting and fun. And he used to talk to me about everything. And we'd go to the hospital and go on calls. And he would talk to me about his cases. You know, not like intimate, personal, like bad confidentiality stuff, but he would just, he, he really taught me medicine. So by the time I was older, he said, hey, you should go to medical school, because I was going to go to nursing school, I'd be a nurse. He said, no, 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 go to medical school. So that's how I, that's what I did. He, my father said I should do it, so I did it. So no, it, why it, psychiatry? <laughs> why there, psychiatry? There's an interesting one. Because I really was curious about what made people, people tick, right. including myself. I want to know, why do I, sometimes I'm feeling OK, and then suddenly I'm not feeling so good. Like, what's going on? Now I realize that um, growing up, I had times of low blood sugar. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea that that's what was going on. Interesting. So you think you're going to learn a psychological answer to things. Mm -hmm. So after doing lots and lots of psychotherapy, what I discovered was nutritional medicine. Wow. And I am at, in control, pretty much, of how I feel. 
it's not control like that. It's control like, oh, I'm feeling a little, a little tired, a little draggy, not so good. Oh, I haven't eaten for a while. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But when people come in and they're dealing with, with, uh, with issues um, and they're taking, most people, if they're health conscious, they have a whole garage full of supplements or counterfeit. Oh, right. And what I've noticed, and I want your opinion on this, is that I find that people, one of the thoughts was, let's take everything just in case. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's, I mean, I did that for 20 years and before I knew. So why don't yeah. you talk a little bit about wow. why it's important to take what exactly you need. Well, that's really interesting because people also will start to get something from one doctor and then they'll go to another natural doctor and get something else. And before you know it, they've accumulated a lot of stuff. Right. So I think we need a test. Yes. And I love that you do the BWA because that actually tells people where they're at and then gives them a specific prescription for them, mm -hmm. tailored to them, and then you measure again in a few months and you see, did it work? But the, other, the most important thing is, how do you feel? Are you thinking more clearly? Do you feel better? Do you have more energy? Did your headaches go away? These are the things you look for. So when I was taking everything mm -hmm. for many years, mm -hmm. um, I was a professional bodybuilder and <laughs> coming off of that, I tried to stay in shape for the majority of my life. Mm -hmm. And I just took everything, but I didn't know if I was feeling good or feeling bad. So what are some of the signs that I'd be feeling bad? You didn't know if you were feeling good or bad? Well, I mean, I, I can tell you that I talked myself into it. I see a lot of people today, they talk themselves into the fact that I'm taking this, I feel better, I'm taking this, I feel better, but they still wake up three times a night, they still I have... I see, yeah, so how do you have, know if something's actually working, right. if it's the how, right how thing? Do, how does somebody out here actually know that they may not be taking the right things or what they are doing isn't working? Well, first of all, testing. I do a whole lot of testing in my own practice, including genetic testing, because then you see the predispositions and then where to go with that. Right. Um, and you've actually taken our BWA test. And I took the BWA, and it, re it really matched pretty well with, with other what? tests that I've yeah. done. Right Not 100%, but pretty yeah. well. Good. And I'm going to track them together and see what, see what comes out. Awesome. So it's, I think it's a very cool test, because you don't have to do a blood test. So uh, when, in, in respect to that, if someone was out here, how would they know that maybe things aren't working for them? What are some signs that they would be looking for? Well, feeling tired. <laughs> Um, feeling feel tired all day. Tired all day. Hard to get up or hard to get up in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then you get. Some, then you're okay. And then you like. And at the end of the day, you're like really up. Then there's a problem because your adrenals are working backwards. They're low in the morning and high at night. It should be high in the morning and low at night. We call that tired and wired. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly right. So, and a lot of people actually have that. Does anybody mm -hmm. here have that? We have tired days. Trouble's going to sleep at night. You're just starting to wind down and things start to rev up. Uh, what about going to sleep? Uh, does anybody here have troubles going to sleep or staying asleep throughout the whole night? Raise your hands, don't be shy. There you go, that looks better. That's, that's actually the kind of response we want. It's really common. Yeah, so, uh, so if somebody was having troubles, let's say going to sleep, what would, be the, what would be some of the issues that they should be looking at or what is it that might be going wrong with them? Well, for very simply, what are they doing close to bedtime, you're working out too close to bedtime, you really should be working out earlier in the day because that revs up your system. Actually, Merle could speak to that. Merle's an acupuncturist who's also a Qigong expert and she really understands the rhythms. And we talked about this the other day. Um, she's a wonderful acupuncturist, by the way. And um, that when you exercise at night, it changes your system. In Chinese medicine, it, it just rouses your system in a way that's not a good thing. So that's one, one thing. Then using a computer at night, um, the blue light special, blue light. the blue light is keeping you awake. So these are simple things. Some, but the other thing is, this is crazy. People sleep with their cell phones. Can you think of someone better to sleep with than your cell phone? I mean, <laughs> kind of desperate, um, thinking you're going to get a text. No, don't, please don't. And if you do need it as an alarm clock, what I've done is if, if I'm traveling, I put it in another room. But have it on airplane mode, please, because that is, a cell phone is pinging all the time. It's sending signals to the tower all the time, and it's receiving signals back. Those are pinging your brain, okay? That's a good point. So, so, so these are all the mechanical EMF, things to EMF know. EMF and radiation? Yeah, so EMF, radiation, um, your modem, and it doesn't necessarily be your modem. It can be the modem next door. And I know I'm living in a condo, and so there's all kinds of modems everywhere, and they're all pinging on me. 
that's not good. And sometimes you just can't control it, but at least you can control your own modem. Better to turn it off at night. So these are some of the issues that are just sort of like the mechanical issues. So what happens biochemically is that we end up having high cortisol at night when we're stressed like this. And when you have high cortisol at night, you wake up. You wake up at like 3 or 4 in the morning going, ah. um, you tend to gain weight around the middle. That's another sign of high cortisol. And you're really tired in the morning because your cortisol gets high during the night. So, so fatiguing at night, um, uh, having troubles going to sleep, and also uh, waking up feeling exhausted. Yeah, you can't, you can't get up. Does anybody here wake up feeling exhausted? Like you didn't go I to did sleep. for 15 years. Literally woke up every day feeling exhausted. And, wow. And I, but I just thought that was the way it was. So how did you fix it? Well, that's, for me, the first thing was to uh, first thing was addressing my bio my biomechanics because if you're breathing wrong and you got body pain, automatically mm -hmm. you have cortisol levels that are elevated. And then the second thing was for me was just uh, testing, having some real clinical evidence to show me exactly where my body was off and balancing my chemistry. And and I can tell you, it was only a couple months when I was doing the right thing. The biggest thing that I find coming into the garage here today is people are taking supplements because they think they have an issue. When, when we test them, they find out that they actually don't. They don't have that issue, it's a different issue. Right. And it, it's, the, it's hard to be able to distinguish so self without the testing. Self-diagnosis. Yeah. So the other thing that I do is when I have people, they come in with their, like, I say, bring in your supplements. If they forget their supplements, it's not good. So people will come in with, like, bags of supplements. I have them put, they put them all out because it's, it's not enough just to tell me what they're on. I need to see them. And sometimes, I mean, it's, like, wacky. But, so some of them I'll look at, I'll just say, they're expired, you know, throw them out. That was me, by the way. By the way, <laughs> expired isn't necessarily bad. You can have things that are a year or two old, and some things just, it doesn't matter. But uh, some things are not so good. And some are like crap, but, you know, like not well made. I know that they're bad companies, so we get rid of those. The other thing I do is I do muscle testing. So, um, have, has anybody experienced muscle testing? Anybody, yeah. Yeah, so it's applied it kinesiology. Testing, it is in the right hands, I think, mm -hmm. because what it's really doing is magnifying my intuition and the person's intuition. It's really our energy fields are connecting and giving a response. It's like here, I'll, like I'll show you what yeah. I'm going to do. Um, yeah, I'll go this way. Okay. Well, I have to do it that way just because of the way I do I, Okay. I know. It's, it's, okay. Mm. Say my name is Gary. My name is Gary. And I'm pushing really hard. Okay. Say my name is John. My name is John. And I'm pushing really... Oh, I didn't have to push very hard. This is my push sore wrist. So did you get it? Yeah. That yeah. your body, that, well, that's something he knows that his name's not John. He knows his name is Gary. If I, if I asked him, you know, um, do you need vitamin C? Yes. Do you need saw palmetto? <laughs> well, but that you know you don't. <laughs> so that's not true. But, I, you know, you can do it that way, like just thinking of something. But... Um, that's doing a re that's really doing it energetically. Oh, I do have I do someone I have someone to hold their stuff, so they'll hold. But what's really interesting is I know you're going to ask something. Hold, but but hold, hold that thought. I will have two different St. John's Wort bottles, mm -hmm. and one will be really good and one won't. So how do you like in the in the, field, in the real world in the world of muscle testing? I mean, you're an MD, and don't and hold it against me. I'm not holding it against you. But you're, you're an MD, and mm -hmm. in the world of muscle testing, it's always been kind of relegated to naturopathic doctors and mm -hmm. chiropractors. So mm -hmm. what does the medical community think about m muscle testing? I have no idea. <laughs> I, haven't asked, I haven't asked them. I haven't asked them. But um, we do know that energies for real. We do electrocar electroencephalograms. We do electrocardiograms. We do EMGs, electromyograms. And those are all the energy that's put off by the cells. Right. So what we're doing is we're using ourselves as the computer, rather than using the EEG machine or the cardiogram. I mean, that's, all, the, that's all they're reading we're anyways. Using, we're just using our own selves as the, the reader. I've always had this comment. I said that if we can train a dog to tell that if somebody has cancer or is going to have low blood because sugar. Because it's, it's the smell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we can train a dog to do that, why yeah. can't we train us to do that? Well, dogs are smarter. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. But so, they, can, they can sniff better than we can. So, uh, so baseline for somebody to understand what it is that they actually need to know, when, especially when they're talking about brain health. Because one of the things that I also found is the brain is the trickiest thing. I don't know when I've got a brain problem predominantly. The brain covers it up. Yeah, yeah. 
Exactly. So how would you how would you describe that to people? Well, it gets tricky, but what I have people do is fill out a questionnaire. And it's really simple. You fill out a questionnaire, um, you're tired, you're anxious, um, are you depressed but kind of wired and anxious, or are you depressed and you can't move? Mm -hmm. Those are all the signs of different depletions. And then I know I can replete with the right nutrients. And then it's trial and error. I will say, okay, let's say they don't want to do lab testing or they can't afford it, or who knows what. Some people don't get lab testing. Um, or if I'm just doing a consultation, you know, brief consultation where we're not going to do testing, we're just going to try some things. And uh, like people f call from my website, and I'm sort of backup for the customer service. So I just f ask what's going on with them. And they try the, what I think was, would work, and you know, 80% of the time it works. And then sometimes it doesn't. The other way to tell, like if, I, if somebody has a lot of supplements is stop them all and then start one at a time and give each one a good day or two. Well, assuming that people you know, are willing to take the time and investment into either taking uh, surveys and questionnaires or tests, mm -hmm. um, the process of doing it, um, it would probably, in my mind, would probably be to, uh, to go and, and take the test uh, get a proper consultation, and, mm -hmm. then, and then go through the process of looking at not only your supplementation, but your diet and your lifestyle. Yes. And I think that's where, in, in my exactly. opinion, what I see is that's where people miss it. It's the way to do it. Just to do supplements. They're called supplements because they supplement your diet, right? They supplement. You really have to start with food, and food is information. It's not just, oh, it tastes good. You know, it's to fill your tummy or you're hungry. It really is information. It turns our genes on and off, right? So we need to get our messages from natural products, from herbs, from, from things that grow, from vegetables, fruit. I mean, we need living things to, to give us the message. So what about the, I mean, the, the topic we talked about a little bit, but what about organic versus non-organic? No contest. I, I, I know that we say no contest, but I've heard a lot of people, and even come into me, and you know we've seen literally thousands of people, and and I hear them say that you know it's not that big of a deal. Okay, I'll I'll tell you. First of all, if you have certain genetic predispositions, like um, a lot of variations in the PON1 uh, gene, you're going to not detox pesticides easily. Well, so so. Uh, so yeah, the don't you, you have to eat organic. I mean, we have so much crap that we're already breathing. And in the water, mm -hmm. even if you're drinking filtered water, which I assume you all are, there's water that you're drinking other places. Where if you go to a restaurant, even I mean, ice. There's, there's ice. I don't, I don't do ice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people do, and, and there's a lot of contaminants in ice, even when you have filtered water. A lot of a lot of ice machines aren't filtered, and a lot of water is. And so when you put unfiltered water, unfiltered ice in filtered water, you get contamination again. Yes, and don't drink ice in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, because um, I, I, I also experience um, that a lot of people, they'll try to eat you know, organic, and they'll do it about 20 or 30% of the time. But, um, yeah, but I, I honestly believe that, it, that if we're going to do it, we need to do it like 90 to 100 percent. Sometimes, sometimes you just can't. I just see the difference. I see the difference in my people, people who come to me, people with leaky gut, so common, leaky gut. What's leaky gut and how do we know about it? We do, I do lab testing. And um, leaky gut is an inflamed gut. We have an inflamed gut. The tight junction, the space between the cells is, is a little gap and the molecules get in that shouldn't. So they haven't been properly broken down, they haven't been properly digested. So when they're absorbed, they're too big and the, body, the antibody system looks and says, what is this? And mounts an attack. So you have an attack against things that are actually food molecules, but it doesn't know that. So you, it starts to attack these foods, gives you an antibody response, and then it's, it will also um, get confuse your with the organ systems and this is a little more complicated than that but you get people who have gluten sensitivity let's say and they're they have an inflamed gut the gluten has a gluten reaction as antibodies it starts to attack the thyroid and the person ends up with thyroiditis and like how did you get to that but that's what you get to and I've taken my thyroid I diagnosed a lot of thyroiditis including people that have been to endocrinologists and who should have, should have diagnosed it so it's an inflammation of the thyroid where the thyroid really attacks itself very bad also, people get diagnosed as bipolar when they have thyroiditis because their moods get all wacky. 
So what I do is begin to fix their leaky gut eating organically, eating healthy foods, not eating the crap, not eating things that are going to give you inflammation, being gluten and dairy free. And the thyroiditis gets better. That's a good one though, because um, look at the fads that are out there today. We've got, I'm gluten intolerant, I'm gluten sensitive, I'm, I eat paleo, I eat raw. So mm -hmm. what, let's, let's talk about some of those. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about somebody who eats raw all the time. Mm -hmm. What do you think? It's very dependent on your genetics, mm -hmm. very dependent on your ancestry. How would you know? Because a lot of people do it. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, raw, or let's say even uh, uh, people who are vegan. And I, I, there's nothing, mm -hmm. I have no, no markers against either being vegan or not. Mm -hmm. But we've tested here mm -hmm. literally hundreds and hundreds of people. And, you know, about 30 or 40% of them are vegan. And when their tests come back, their tests are horrible. I mean, we're talking liver, adrenal problems, kidney issues. And when I ask them, so why did they choose to eat vegan, one of the responses I get all the time is it made me feel better. And so it made them feel better. And my, my thought is they're feeling better because their system isn't already working OK. And, and I don't know, what do you think about something like that? I think that for some people, being vegan is really fine. Mm -hmm. I have a friend, actually a famous politician, who has managed I mean, amazingly to eat organically and vegan for years and years and years. And it's been really good for him because he had Crohn's disease. Right. And for him, it was the perfect diet and probably genetically, you know, not, he was Eastern European, I don't know why, but genetically, it, it, somehow it worked for him. Mm -hmm. But veganism doesn't always work because you often don't get enough protein. It's very hard. And, and then also with vegans, there are not enough B12 and carnitine. Are you going to remember to take B12 and carnitine? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's another issue. So if we're going to pick a lifestyle, like being vegan or eating raw, we mm -hmm. have to, we, it should be more important that we understand. You have to be very disciplined about right. it. Right. And also understand what else, we need to, what else we need to do. Yeah, you need to be testing. How's your vitamin D? Your other, you, you, you need to check all your vitamins and all your, um, your levels. More than once in your life. And, <laughs> and, and your amino acid levels and protein levels. How often would somebody, would, how often would it be reasonable for somebody to actually check levels like uh, do uh, blood work or saliva work or testing or how often would you recommend? Is it like Every three once to a year? Three to six months. Every three to six months. It right. depends on what you're testing. If you right. just can do a regular blood panel. Um, probably six months. I mean, I, I test my people every six months. I'll do a complete hormone panel. It includes vitamin D, a homocysteine, so you can see if you're methylating properly, CRP for inflammation. I don't want to get too technical here. Right, right, right. But, um, but the general, the general idea my, is a lot of people don't... You want to, you want to do this every six months. Uh, people uh, just generally, the, I, I found that, you know, I, I grew up in Canada. We grew up with a slightly different... So did I. That's right. Hey. hey. I <laughs> Fellow Canadian. And oh, Canada. Are you sure it's a Canadian look? Any other Canadians So, where did you grow up? It's French. Oh, Montreal. Montreal. Luke Robitaille is an all star hockey player. Can, Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice to have you here. So, we got some Canadians here, and then we got Andy over there. So, I grew up. With... So, so, I actually. I actually grew up uh, with, a, with a completely different uh, food diet and, and I noticed that when I came across into the United States that first of all, the first thing that happened to me when I came to the United States is I gained 50 pounds. You, you go from real food to processed food instantly. Instantaneously. I gained 50 yeah. pounds my first year here. I have pictures yeah, I to totally prove it. I totally get it. And, and, I, I, and I also noticed that a couple things here um, is that everywhere I go portions are big. Um, and even in California, which is probably the most moderate of them all, the portions are still big. And I also found that there's not a lot of education at the in restaurants because I eat a lot, eat a lot. And in restaurants, there's not a lot of education um, as to where the what the products are. So there's a local movement. It's called Farm to Table, and a lot of rest of, there's a number of restaurants mm -hmm. that are actually doing it. How do you feel about that? It's the pedigree of what you're eating. Well, the more, and this is so interesting because it's been an evolution for me. And at this point, um, my, I find my choices are getting more and more refined simply be, by doing it. And it's not like a moral issue. It's not being a stickler. It's, it's like my preference just feels, I think, vibrationally, energetically. I don't mean like too woo-woo-ish, but <laughs> hey, what can I say? But it's, I don't like like really 
like food where I know, where I can sense, feel, taste that there's stuff in it that I don't want. Well, so, so whether, uh, I guess a so lot of So farm to table, up, yes, I want to know yeah. what's in it. I don't want GMO food. Anybody here want GMO food? That's yeah. what's really going to bust your gut. The, the, the GMOs are made to kill the gut of the insect. So what do you think it's doing to your gut? Bad news. So in GMOs are the things that are in almost all fast foods and yeah. uh, almost all processed foods mm -hmm. uh, have GMOs in them. Yeah. And, and so the purpose of GMO really, like you said, was to destroy the insect's stomach. So it does the same thing to ours and there is no getting around that. Nope. That's, sure that's scientifically and clinically proven. Mm -hmm. yeah, and and uh, if it's I go to evil. A, it's if, evil. So many countries have banned GMOs. If I go to a grocery store and I pick stuff off of a shelf, or I pick, I put, I, I pick meats out and stuff like that, there is a 100% chance that it has GMOs in it, unless it says mm -hmm. no GMOs. Yeah, because the, 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 what it ate had GMOs in it. Right. What the animal ate. And and I you know I hear again I hear a lot of people say, well, it's not that big of a deal. And and or it works for me right now. Look at me, I'm healthy. And this is, a, this is one oh, of the things yeah, yeah. that we find even in, in, in our work with biomechanics is somebody comes in and they have a small pain in their, in their body, they have a, a, a strain in their leg, and that happened when they were 13 years old, and now when they're 50 or 60, we're actually they're doing, looking at hip replacements and stuff like that because mm -hmm. it takes that long yeah. for that to happen. This is the same thing with food. Yeah. It is. Yep. And so something that I've been eating for 20, 30 years that seems to have no effect on me can actually... And we mask it. See, this is it. We mask that. So we're eating bad food and we don't notice anything. Oh, that's fine. I eat, I eat bread. I'm okay. Well, you go off. This is so interesting if you've ever done this. Has anyone done this? You go on some sort of a detox for a few weeks where you don't eat any of the, quote, bad stuff or the allergenic stuff. And then you go back and test. And the way the test is, is should be one food at a time. One food at a time so you can see how your body reacts. You really notice it. Like, oh my god. I, I remember the first time I, I, I was experimenting with, I went gluten-free. Oh, big deal, I went gluten-free. First thing I noticed within a couple of days is I stopped having aching here. And that was chronic. I thought, you know, it's because I'm sitting you know, over a computer. and. No, it was from, it was an inflammatory response. I notice now I have a thing with my wrist, so if I eat something inflammatory, and I may not know, see this is it, when you eat unknown food. Like, I woke up one morning and I said, my wrist hurts, what did I eat yesterday? And I'd eaten at a fairly decent place. I don't know what the heck was in it. I don't know where you grew up, but I grew up with a mother that cooked mystery meat. Oh, <laughs> oh really? Everything was unknown. You know, oh. when, I, when, I, when I grew up, we, we actually prayed after we ate. <laughs> what do you think of dairy products if they're raw? Well, that's an interesting thing because raw dairy has the enzymes that help to digest it. Now, uh, in India, in Ayurvedic medicine, milk is a big deal. Milk is a big, raw milk is important. Um, some people can really do well with raw milk, and it's medicinal. Uh, other people still have a dairy sensitivity, but it's certainly much better. I mean, the pasteurized stuff that we have is like, oh, bad. It's bad. There's not much. There's not, not much redeeming about dairy the way we have it. It's pasteurized. It's there's nothing in it. No nutritional. Not much nutritional value. The issue that I have with buying organic is, okay, I go to Ralph's, it's right next to my house. Um, food doesn't look that good, but my only choice is to buy organic. And all the organic products are from Mexico. How safe is that? <laughs> my, my only option for tomatoes for the next six months until, or the next three months until a farmer's market when they start getting good tomatoes is they're all from Mexico. Mm -hmm. Don't eat them out of season. But like, I don't, I don't know how to trust like when I'm getting my food from other countries and they're saying it's organic. Well, you check What's that the... company. That there's a, there is a specific company that does organic. No, well, they have good organic stuff in Mexico. But do you think it's Mexico. organic? Just even though it's coming it's from like... another country? But when they, but does, when the hey, organic food travels here, doesn't it have to be sprayed with pesticides? No, it's travel? the USDA. Actually, if it's certified USDA organic, it goes through their process. And not that I trust the U.S. government totally, <laughs> but but there is there is a there is a there is a checks and balance for that. Yeah, as long as it's USDA certified organic. Um, what I'm curious about is what you can recommend for people to help heal their guts. 
So not just to supplement it, but how can you make the organism itself, like how can you make the liver function better? How can you make you know, the stomach function better? What are some of the foods that you can recommend to help heal? Well, that's a much longer, <laughs> longer answer. But I actually, you know, by the way, I mean, this is a good question, and I have a newsletter that I put out. So as I said, if you go to my website and you sign on to get my Reclaim Your Brain, you'll also get my newsletter. And in my newsletter, I keep recommending these different courses that you can listen to online. Usually they're free or else they're pretty cheap. And you can learn all about the gut, how to heal it. I mean, there's some amazing courses that have been on recently. Uh, and then there's Donna Gates, who actually lives nearby, who does some really good teaching about the gut. It's eating, it's eating certain foods, like fermented foods, because that helps the microbiome. You want to really recreate your, uh, the microbiome or the healthy bacteria, the friendly bacteria in the gut. Um, you want to take things like glutamine that help to restore that very thin lining. It's one cell thick. So glutamine, I, I don't want to just do little pop things here and then you oh, I'll buy glutamine, I'll buy this. It's really, it's really individualized. And I have, like, I have some products that I carry in my office. So if I have somebody with GI problems, I may give them berberine. I may give them glutamine. Um, maybe a, a product that has a combination powder that they mix, you mix with water and you have, take it a few times a day. Aloe vera if it's acute, if you have acute inflammation. So you do that and you eat foods that don't irritate. Uh, usually they, they, they need to be steamed. Raw, raw food's a little hard on the gut, especially when you're just healing it. Are you seeing somebody Ayurvedic? And by the, way, by the way, Ayurveda has some very good healing systems for the gut. Um, Chinese medicine, um, acupuncture and qigong and, and herbs. Uh, Western medicine has very little to offer, very little. So. so I just want to ask a question, the relationship between brain and digestion. We talk a lot about digestion, but also how much digestion influences the brain. I know there's, digestion is a first line of defense. Mm -hmm. So even when we are in our mom's belly, when we're just conceived, there's a, there's a um, connection between brain and digestion at that time. So every time when we get headaches, actually it comes from digestion. So it's a very connected system. They say that the, the second sto stomach is the second, the second brain. brain. The second brain, that is the second brain, yeah. Very connected. See, in the vagus nerve, which is the longest nerve in the body, goes from the gut all the way up to the brain, and it's constantly sending messages. So it's not only that we have an infl inflammation in the gut, and that sends inflammatory cytokines, that's the cyt inflammatory messengers to the brain, but we actually have a, a vagus nerve where the bugs, this is amazing, we have more bugs, cells of bacteria of the microbiome than we have cells of our own body, okay? So the, this microbiome can make us feel happy, can make us feel sad. It's, it's amazing, they've done um, transplants. Actually what they do is they, they transplant some of the microbiome in rats, from happy rats to sad rats, and they can actually make the sad rats happy and the happy rats sad by transferring the microbiome. And um, that would be, well, actually, the, these are, we want to get very, um, we, we could talk about that. <laughs> so I have a, a question more, more along the lines of hope. So, you know, the title of this talk was really inspiring for me. I have a number of family members that have suffered from mental illness and have committed suicide. And so one of the things okay. I, that's, uh, so one of the things that I came hopeful to hear about, I guess what I want to hear from you is, are you hopeful? that with, like, as we evolve as a species and we kind of get back to the, our roots of like healthy foods, organic foods, things like that, that the, the, the significant amount of people in the country and in the world that are on antidepressants, that those things can become a thing of the past? Oh, yeah, that from your mouth to God's ear. Now, because we're on this kind of, we're going two ways. We're going toward Monsanto and technology and not such good technology and, and making farming too technological and artificial, and then this, the return to nature. And that, you know, that's the hopeful part. The increase in suicides, I hate to say it, it has to do with the medications. I mean, there's no question, no question. The mass murders 
you know, the being people going postal, the, the um, mass murders in schools, these are all people that were recently put on antidepressants, had their antidepressants changed, and it's, docu it's totally documented. I'm not just like, oh yeah, she's just, meh. this is really real, and it's suppressed because these people settle. They settle with the drug companies, and the drug companies, I mean, this is horrific, and the whistleblowers in the, in the drug companies have said this, that they kind of budget well, you budget so well. There's going to be so many settlements because there'll be so many suicides, but we'll handle it. Ha suicides, homicides. It's horrifying. People who were never suicidal. Oh, because they were depressed. No, they were never suicidal. They, young people, they were never suicidal. Were put on an antidepressant for just some situational thing, and ended up hanging themselves, or committing. You know, it's it's really scary. And I, maybe you're referring to that also. Depression, a lot of people that are depressed and, and, and suicidal have very, very low levels of essential fatty acids. So there's been very good research there in that, in that area. Not in, you know, in, in all of psychiatry, if somebody says they're suicidal, they're going to be given a drug, the doctor isn't going to think, oh yeah, I read this thing about essential fatty acids. They should have been. They should have read it because it's in the literature. But they won't because the drug companies are kind of, have, have them brainwashed. But um, I sound radical, don't I? Yeah. Yeah. So um, not that I'm a miracle worker, but there are ways that we have to start with giving the body the support it needs, the diet and nutrients. You really got to do that. And you better be eating organic food because if your body, if your liver is detoxifying Prozac and Zoloft and all these other drugs, and it has to detoxify the pesticides because it has to do that too, and it's detoxifying your hormones because that's what it does, you know, breaks down your hormones, you have a sick liver. You do not want a sick liver. You want a liver that's able to handle what's thrown at it. So you want to minimize drugs meds, alcohol. You want to minimize these things, not for moral reasons, but because you have a liver mm -hmm. and you have a body that's going to store all this stuff. And by the way, pot, if you think pot's okay, it isn't. It sits in your, in your fat cells for years and years and years and years and makes you dopey. Just you should know. And this is, again, it's not moral. I, I was campaigning for medical marijuana in the early 2000s in my book, Natural Highs, where I talked about all these neurotransmitters. I did have a little section on medical marijuana and, you know, it's okay, we have other things to do too. But don't think it's innocent because when people stop smoking dope um, and they've allowed a few months to clean out because unfortunately it sticks, it really sticks. Um, and and you, you can kind of wash it out of your system. So it was the clarity that comes back. Anyway, you should just know that. And when you get off the medication, so what I do is I have people get off very, very, very gradually. Some people can get off it more quickly than others. Um, it just really depends on you. Sometimes I can take somebody from 50 to 30 to 20 to 10, but uh, sometimes it's 50 to 45 to 30. And then when you get to the lower ones, it's, you have to take a liquid and just drip it, take small amounts, you know, small decreases. But it works, and people can, can get off meds. And sometimes, but on the other hand, if somebody's done really well on meds and they're okay and they're content, it's fine. Stay on it. I mean, it's not, it's not, what can I say? It's their choice. Um, so it's not a sin to be on medication. It's just that it really does have, it has some deleterious effects. Most people are suffering from side effects, lack, lack of libido, sleep problems, anxiety, um, not thinking clearly, all kinds of things. If you're doing well on an on a antidepressant, you like it, fine. But as um, so I said, diet, supplements and very slowly weaning off very carefully. I just wanted a, a reminder of the foods and supplements that help us to methylate, um, to make the neurotransmitters better. For methylate? Yeah. Methylation, um, well, because you're, you're not turning folic acid into methylfolate. So you need to take folinic acid or methylfolate. One of the symptoms that people complain about when they're getting off meds is they have brain zaps. They feel like electric shocks. They feel terrible. Well, essential fatty acid, omega-3s, great. They stop the brain zaps. Um, take some methyl B12. It helps to metabolize the B vitamins you're taking to make your own neurotransmitters. So give the body what it needs, and it will take care of you.
Yes. Um, so I, I'm a vegetarian and have been for many years. Um, mm -hmm. And I eat a lot of plants and vegetables. Um, I've been noticing the last year me getting up in the middle of the night to go to the restroom. Um, maybe two, three times. And it's mm -hmm. not that I have an issue going back to sleep and it's not that I have an issue getting up other than just to really simply <laughs> use the ladies room. And so I'm just wondering if I'm drinking too much water or if the plants have too much water content or if I'm not absorbing it because I never really had that issue before. And I always have tea before I go to bed. Well, that'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> Take tea and pee. Isn't that what it's? Is that, I because mean, I was wondering if something's going on I have, a, I have something actually from, from our, my work with Dr. Rubenstein for many years. Uh -huh. um, so when you get up, uh, it takes uh, 30 minutes uh, for the kidneys to pass liver to the back bladder. Okay. So if you get up three times a night, yeah. that means that for 30 minutes, each of those times, you have to be awake already. So your brain has a microarousal. And a microarousal has to occur in order for you to urinate in your sleep. And so it doesn't matter the amount of liquid you drank beforehand. Um, and this is a clinical, uh, very, very large uh, numbered study, over 5,000 people in the study that, that came up with this information. But the, the most important thing is, is that you're not getting a minimum of an hour and a half of sleep a night. So if you're sleeping six hours, you're really getting four and a half. Right, and, and that, I'm up like between seven and eight, and I'm like up and I'm... So that's more likely, and that's, that's having an effect on brain health and the way you sleep and the way your body produces dopamine and serotonin and stuff like that as well. And that's a big issue as well. So that's cortisol. cortisol levels. And cortisol levels come from a lot of different things. It could be imbalances, literally, in, in our biochemistry. A cortisol, one of the single largest producers of cortisol in the human body is biomechanical dysfunction and breathing respiration problems. If you can't, re if you can't have any problems breathing, and I don't mean, it, we all breathe, right? So we think that, I take a deep breath. So everybody sit and take a deep breath. Okay, now watch somebody else in the room, okay? And what I want you to do is watch them take a breath and I want you to watch your shoulders. Okay, do it. So if the shoulders of the person you're, you're, you're watching is rising, that means that they're using their shoulders and their neck to breathe. And that means that it's not about oxygen into the lungs, it's about oxygen delivered into the cells. And that amount actually is seven times greater when you breathe with your diaphragm. So there are things that, that are biomechanically causing problems. And also if you have pain, a neck pain, a shoulder pain, you're laying in bed. That doesn't help either. <laughs> but you have all those other issues that are going on. All, I, all, I'm, all I'm suggesting is that if you're, if you're at that stage where you're waking up three times a night, I was in that stage too. There are other things that were going on. I suggest that you just take a little farther look into it. We test a little bit and find out what's going on. That's what I was asking before. That's a warning sign that maybe I need to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And you did something and it worked. Yeah, so biomechanical, biomechanical respiration is one of the actually largest ones. Uh, we get primarily, our, we can't convert dopamine if we don't have oxygen. And if we don't have oxygen, our, our uh, cortisol levels instantaneously go up because we fire adrenaline, noradrenaline, and norepinephrine to try and get us oxygen. You want to see, uh, see a body that, that has cortisol production? Just constrict the chest. Just, const just constrict the breathing and the brain, brain freaks out and says, I don't like that and tries to figure it out. So it's not just a matter of just having your brain and the, and the food you're eating. Your body also has to work well too. And you know what? A lot of people, we had this conversation the other day. A lot of people think that going to the gym and eating great is, proper, is a proper maintenance for their body. If you compare it to a car, that would be washing your car and that would be putting gas in your car. But if you don't check your brakes and you don't clean your air filters and you don't clean your oil filter and you don't check uh, your electrical system once in a while, you're going to have a problem eventually. Eventually that car is going to crash. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me is the importance of the liver and what it does for the human body. Maybe that would be a good topic. Yeah, well the liver, I mentioned it earlier, the liver is the chemical factory. It's, it's making bile, which helps to, what does bile do? Does anybody know here? breaks down fat, right, it helps you to digest fats. So people who don't have a gallbladder, they're not concentrating it, so they have to do something a little differently. So, because it doesn't have a place to kind of contain it. Uh, the liver is breaking down our hormones. 
which we need, we need to break them down because we're recycling them. It's a, it's a real recycling center. It's recycling all the toxins that we bring in and it turns them into something that we then can excrete. So, so with, uh, it's with very busy, the liver is very busy. The liver is busy. I mean, it's, it cycles our blood, I think, what is it, once, once, uh, once every like um, two and a half minutes or something like that. It's, it's some crazy amount. So, so one of the most important things, and a lot of times is because we're eating, uh, we're eating um, uh, foods that are not organic. We're mm -hmm. taking medication. Uh, we, some people drink alcohol. Yeah, so we drink a little alcohol. All these things contribute to our liver often being overworked. And over time, even if we, like for, for me, I thought I was healthy. But what I realized when I started to do testing is I wasn't as healthy as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest shock for me. And the biggest thing for me was my liver. My liver was completely just not functioning. Uh, and, and, that, and that was in my mid-40s. And I was probably on the healthier side. Um, and that's, that's where a lot of people are at today. So if you have a bad liver, what are some of the things that you might notice in your, either in your life or your diet? Or what are some things that you would notice? Like how would I know I had a bad liver possibly? It takes a while to, to find out because you know, it's so hard to really be, have a, have, be symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Being tired, tired, headaches, headaches, um, irritable, angry. Yes, angry. Yeah. Angry people have liver problems. <laughs> liver congestion. <laughs> no, that, and that's all truthfulness. You can look at behavior in people, and you can actually correlate it right to uh, biomechanical function, mm -hmm. our bi biochemical function. You know what's what's going on in their body, right? Yeah. And you see that with people all the time. Being a psychiatrist, you see somebody come in your office and. Quite often, they'll be storming in and, and having problems, and uh, and you can you can tell right away that there's something mm -hmm. wrong with their diet, right? Right. There are women who aren't breaking down estrogen properly mm -hmm. because their liver is congested, because it's working too hard. You can have sore breasts because the estrogen isn't being broken down properly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, yeah. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering what your experience is with pulse electromagnetic frequency technology and. Mm -hmm. Um, different modalities for improving circulation once you have the the base foundation of nutrition uh, you know proper hydration proper supplements to expedite the process to of circulation okay so this is pulse electromagnetic frequency PEMF for short and there are a few different devices around quite a few devices around and what's so is that um, we the Earth's electrical field and oh, magnetic field is not as strong as it was. And we need it. And we need to have a stronger magnetic frequency. And the PEMF actually pulses, pulses into us and gives us extra energy. And we, have, you, we can use that extra energy, uh, as you say, biomechanically. But to, it, it spiffs up the body. It really helps. It speeds up healing. It speeds up metabolism in a good way. You don't get like speedy, speedy but it's quite healing. I mean, this is, this is important. So what you're trying to do really here yeah. is bring people together, bring um, practitioners together mm -hmm. where everything is coordinated. Absolutely. And, and that doesn't happen. It doesn't it's, happen very often. You know, like I'm in private practice. And what I've done is when somebody's seeing other practitioners, I'll call the other practitioners and see if we can coordinate. And I'll tell my, I say to the patient, you don't have to decide whether to do my regime or their regime. I'll talk to them and we'll figure it out. But that's a lot of work. You know, it's nice to have it all under one That's roof. been the so hardest thing you, to do. That's what you're yeah, attempting right. to do, which I think is really, really important because that puts the person as the focus. Mm -hmm. It's right. patient-centered yeah. or individual-centered treatment rather than at the convenience um, and maybe sometimes the ego of the practitioner. So we, in order to accomplish that, actually, uh, that's one of the things. We are completely 100% non-medical. Uh, in every way, shape, or form, we don't diagnose. And when we bring in medical practitioners, they all have a similar belief to our, to our structure, which are, we believe 100% in balance. Uh, if anything is out of balance, your body is going to fight. If I'm literally leaning my head forward and my shoulders forward, my body is going to fight to get me back into balance. Whether it's uh, psychology, neurology, physiology, it doesn't matter. And so part of the, part of the issue why we appreciate you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Cass, is because you that's have always represented brain health, which is really balance. And that's, and, that's, and that's really what we're trying to do. 
as far as we know, we're the only organization anywhere that does biomechanical. So we actually do the physical work, then we do the chemical work, and then we have nutritionists, we have naturopathic doctors, and everybody's on the same roof, under the same principle, yeah. looking at the client as our primary interest point. So has anybody here been around to any specialist? And you go from doctor to doctor, you try to get appointments. Everybody here has done it at one point. And what happens is, is that you go to a doctor, you get a referral, you go to a specialist, you try to book an appointment, and that process drags on for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. And that's not in Unless you're at Kaiser. Unless you're at Kaiser. <laughs> 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 but that process drags on and on and on, and exactly what you said. So my experience in 20 years of trying to get myself better was that everybody had a different opinion, and everybody's opinion contradicted the other one before. And uh, do you find that happen a lot in medicine today? Yeah, it, it does, it does. It's good when the docs talk to each other, but then again, when they're doing strictly Western medicine, yeah. um, I, that's limited because they're not taking into account, like the good things about Western medicine, you know, sure. you can do ultrasounds and MRIs and um, set bones and do surgery and take out tumors and there's some, some good things, but there are a lot of things that aren't good and that, or that are missing. Mm -hmm. And so when someone can put together conventional medicine information with all the other stuff that we know, energy medicine, um, herbal medicine, nutrition. I mean, then you have something. Then, then you really have something to work with. So um, just to, because we got a few things and we have time coming up, I know that there's a couple things that, that, I, that I wanted to people to know about you. Number one is that you're a fantastic author um, and reading through your stuff. It's not only it's not only well placed that it's also it's timely. It's not something that's dated. It's not something that, that was written now and can't be applied in ten years. It's completely applicable. Mm -hmm. Everything that you've written, and you have some books here. We actually have those books that you can buy, and uh, we've got one of them right here. Yeah, I have the Addicted Brain, and I uh, have my Eight Weeks to Vibrant Health book. And the Addicted Brain is not always about drug and alcohol, right? No. It's about any kind of addiction, right? Yeah. So we have uh, these two books, and uh, these are available. We we'll have them at the back, and you can get these today. Uh, really interesting, worth a read. And because we've always felt here at the at the garage is that information is power. <clears throat> and 20 years trying to fix myself, <clears throat> what I found is that the entire system of healthcare was designed to make me feel stupid, so that I wouldn't ask questions. And I know that sounds pretty tough when I say that, but that's the reality, mm -hmm. is that doctors really didn't like me asking questions, because I asked a lot of questions. And uh, you know, now what we're doing here, what we believe is to give you all the information. And books like this are what's really changing the face. I mean, you're an MD, and you're writing books, and you're talking about nutrition. And, and you're talking about nutrition in a very, very sane and sane way, which is not really happening out there. So I want to congratulate you for that, and I suggest you pick up these books. They're fantastic. They're worth a read. And also, uh, you have some supplements that are specific to the conditions and the healthcare. Do you want to talk about those a little bit? Yes, I have. What I did was I developed a line of supplements because particularly at the time I did it, which was a few years ago, there was nothing on the market that, were, that had the ingredients in that I wanted. Uh, for example, my brain recovery AM and PM, uh, there's an AM and a PM bottle, hence the name, brain recovery AM and PM, and um, how clever. So the next time I'm going to color code the label so we can tell them apart. But what I did was I took probably the equivalent of the five or six different formulas. So instead of opening up a bunch of different bottles, you only have to open two bottles. You have to take maybe five of them, five of these, five of these, but it's a multivitamin. It has um, NAC and alpha lipoic acid, which helps to detox. It has glutamine and, and alpha lipoic acid, which also happens to balance blood sugar. It has silymarin for the liver and on and on, and neurotransmitter precursors, things that make dopamine, norepinephrine, tyrosine. So uh, we're looking at balance. The green line is the balance, and, it, and what we do is we measure urine and saliva for a lot of interesting reasons, um, but it's, very, it's fast and it's efficient. But, but what we're looking at is things like your pH level, your oxidative stress, your electrolyte balance, your carbohydrates and, and your proteins, how your metabolism, how does your body actually process them? We're looking at things like inflammation, your alkaline ions, digestion, hydration, toxicity, your liver, kidneys, adrenals, <clears throat> and whether they're working correctly, whether they're working too hard, whether they're overworking, not working hard enough. 
And this gives us a good baseline to see what you may need. And what I've found over all the years of doing it is that taking something that you don't need is just as bad as not taking something that you do need. It's really important to understand your body. And I think a long time ago, we, we uh, were taught how to understand our body. And that's just something that in modern society, we're not. We're not taught to understand what's, what, our body, what signs, what our body, when we can't think properly, what is it that's going on. Um, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, uh, it's very much about understanding the body and how it functions. But in light of that, um, since we don't have the ability, we weren't taught that since at birth, uh, we need to have some sort of mechanism. So this is the test. Um, and tonight we're actually, uh, actually going to be uh, running some specials and I'll tell you about them in a, in a bit. But I just wanted you to quickly take a look at what, what a testing mechanism looks like. And uh, we're going to wrap up just uh, the, the general presentation. We've got a few announcements. Dr. Cass, I want to thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you.